Welcome everyone to another edition of the Civ Battle Royale audio narration. My name is Dawkins and let's get to it. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to the Civ Battle Royale part 65. I'm your narrator, last minute, first time narrator, White Fang 131 and this right here is the cylinder. It's a very nice cylinder, it's our cylinder of course, which has been depicted by Catalan Man. And this is a map depicting the current state of the cylinder at the end of the last part, created by Laxaraxariskal and Malsistra. And what an exciting and unexpected part that was! So many wars, so much blood to be spilled in the upcoming part. Be prepared. A single slide from the power rankings of the last part. Not particularly surprising is the leader of the rankings at the moment, the Boars, who reclaimed first place from the Inuit. Check out the full list in the description below. Brought to you by Sitting on Chairs 1 is a current analysis of the wars currently going on and who is fighting who. I'll probably be referring back to this because of how many wars there are right now, and how glad I am for that. We kick off this part with a bit of Mexican brutalizing as the Buccaneers sweep through Central America. Once the Mexican reinforcements near Austin have been taken care of, Laredo will most likely remain in Henry Morgan's hands, but I predict that Guadalajara will flip some more, since it's much easier for Mexican forces to reach due to their railroad leading to the city. Also note the small detachment of the Wabagong Armada sent to aggravate Wapahu, originally a Polynesian city before it was basically slaughtered, but here we see it has regained some of its population, but for how long? Oh, this hurts my Spartan soul. I see that shoe joke, White Fang. Seeing the Boers blitz the Mediterranean, taking the Italian cities, which were taken by Leonidas so long ago, the Spartan naval carpet is all but gone in this area of the fighting, and the Boers are making significant gains, while Rome falls again to Ingolfer of Iceland. While Leonidas could flip Mananea back, he won't hold it, and all other cities in the area will almost definitely remain in Kruger's hands, excluding Rome, of course. Meanwhile, Mexico is dropping bombs all over Blackfoot cities and has pushed paratroopers into the Blackfoot core. Aha Patape looks like it's got a few flips left in it, but A Ninanin looks like it will stay in Benito's hands. A massive counterstrike of global offense has struck Henry Morgan right in the face, and Benito takes back Guadalajara and drops a threatening amount of units in the area. Henry will suffer large losses taking back Guadalajara, if he ever does. Australian Japan has suffered greatly, and all cities are heavily damaged. Fallout remains near Wakayama after a cheeky nuke was dropped on it. In comparison to the Australian core, this area looks very half-empty, or half-full, depending. Yakusha, realizing their mistake in invoking the wrath of Japan, peace out and pray for forgiveness. And in the theater of the conflict, Trigger Dakan of Yakusha and Sejong of Korea are seriously throwing down, with both sides have extensively damaged cities near each other's borders. But Sejong has the numbers to push, which he should take advantage of if he wants to become a serious power. Ale Salese of Ethiopia declares war on Genghis Khan of Mongolia. Previously, Ethiopia was home to the traveling Mongolian prophet. Sadly, his whereabouts are unknown. Would you look at the carpet, though? The size of it is enough to make Kruger struggle with pushing through, if he ever decides to declare war. Meanwhile, David in Israel sits with Hale in pure fear as he is housing more Ethiopian soldiers than his actual people. The Spartans whittle down Yerevan and Artashad firmly in their grasp, but they're looking quite thin. Their wars in the west must be wearing down on them very, very hard. Also of note is how Vietnam has already incorporated Persia into the empire with vicious efficiency. As if he hasn't got enough troubles right now, Semiramis reports that Gustavus of Sweden is plotting against Leonidas. If they decide to go to war as well, it could spell the end of Sparta very quickly. It should be noted that due to Kruger of the Boers taking Montanea, Sparta and Iceland no longer share a border. Unfortunately, they still share a border with Kruger, who has decided to be thorough with his invasion thus far. Hagen, being the kind-hearted man he is, has decided to continue to allow Brazilian soldiers holiday throughout his lands. He has not learned. However, Finnish peacekeepers are his saving grace currently, preventing Cibber forces from gaining access to Yakushan lands and flipping Amga, which is very low on health. In the west, Yakusha and Finland beat up on Mongolia, likely while Kekkonen and Taigen laugh and reminisce about the good times when they first attacked Genghis. In the south, Typhlus is likely to fall to either Genghis or Sejong, as it is in very low health and both have units in the area. Boar peacekeepers stare into the sight of the battles, infuriated that they can only keep the peace in Genghis's lands. 
More carnage, more destruction, and it's amazing. Fox looks like he might be getting a little liberal with his nukes, and for that, we love him dearly. But for all of his efforts, it looks as if Sebu will fall. Only a paratrooper guards it from a Vietnamese horde. Lok Tor Ogar. Boy, he did it! He really did it! Parks nuked Hanoi, the crazy bastard! Buddhist monks are infuriated because it killed all of the good trees that they used to sit under. The Trungs of Vietnam have a settler out and about in preparation for when one of their cities gets nuked off the face of the cylinder. The Trungs push on Australian Sri Lanka and take several cities, all of which are unlikely to flip back due to the lack of Australian reinforcements. An Inuit scout enjoys the bloodshed from just outside Colombo as he sweats vigorously in the heat. Four in Icelandic units land on Greece, and it looks as if Engelfer's paratroopers might flip Sparta, while Kruger surrounds Messania with XCOM soldiers. Wow, Kekkonen of Finland decides he wants to finish what he started and alongside Sri, Sri Lanka and Sibir, dives for Leonidas' neck to kill him before the Boers or Ingolford do. And with all those paratroopers, Kekkonen might do some serious damage in the eastern half of Sparta. Three civilizations divide Greece equally between them as Leonidas' Greek troops split right out of there. Kekkonen has also taken Trebizond with great speed. This looks to be the end for Leonidas now. As soon as Kekkonen joined this battle, the eastern half of the Spartan Empire, rather the core of it now, was massively damaged and Varna was ripped from Leonidas. Leonidas has only a handful of units left, whereas Kekkonen has an entire carpet of paratroopers within range of Leonidas' land. The Trungs push again on Australian Sri Lanka with no Australian reinforcements in sight. Sejong has made considerable gains, taking... Now, please, bear with me, everybody. Tiflis, Tiakchir, Ambarchik, and the Akushan capital of Jokusai. Taigan seems to have contracted a virus called Mithridatism, okay, and his civilians now outnumber his combat units in this slide. Yikes, things do not look good for Taigan. Kekkonen continues to carve up Mongolia and looks like he intends to take Kazan. Sibir still hasn't broken through into Yakushin lands to take Amga, though. Back in the other major theater of war, Benito makes a significant push against Henry Morgan, and it looks like I might eat my earlier words, as he looks as if he could take Laredo. Meanwhile, the other Henry of Australia takes both Merida and Waipahu, though he hasn't reinforced them as of yet. Chile takes back their capital. I honestly didn't see that coming, as Henry Park seems to have given up on his second war with Chile, most likely to either focus on Mexico or Vietnam. But in any case, it's highly likely that Pedro of Brazil will take over Santiago de Chile again. Meanwhile in Pirate Portugal, where land units are an option, but not necessary, Henry Morgan plans to beat a dead horse with the ribs it's already lost from everyone else kicking the hell out of it, and plots against Leonidas, but since he now has to go through both Icelandic and Boer territory to reach Sparta, it's doubtful he'd do anything useful even if he did declare war. After losing his capital as well as two others, Leonidas pieces out with Kruger and Ingolfer. However, in a rage fueled by steroids and pre-workout drinks, Leonidas and his men take back Us, Trebizond, and Varna from Kekkonen. It's, most, it's almost as if Kekkonen joining the war woke something up in Leonidas, an age-old fury and lust for revenge. Taigan takes back Jakusai, but he's looking very thin right now. He needs to make a peace deal or he could lose even more. Nestled between the trunks very comfortably is Tibet, and look how cute they are, making their very own peace deals with Persia. Little cuties. As the hot potato that is Jakusai gets thrown again, Sejong catches it, and looking at how few units Taigan has left, it looks like it's likely to stay Korean. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. These crazy Chileans! In a peace deal with Henry Parks, who is leaving them alone, Chile gives them a city. A city with a lot of land area. And I don't think there's anything else significant on this slide, or the slide before that. So, let's continue. Boy, he did it! The Lone Ranger has stood up to the Mexican tyrant and will lay the smack down! Austin 316, let's see a Stone Cold Stunner. In all seriousness, Texas actually has a chance to gain here, if the Buccaneers manage to push back and weaken the surrounding cities. Otherwise, this is suicide. Speaking of the Buccaneers, they've lost Laredo and I'm currently in the process of eating my words. Also worth noting, the use of nuke bias for the Texans is abnormally high. Crowfoot is looking a bit on the thin side these days, as Benito starts to damage his core, and gaps are widening within his own ranks. I'm a Blackfoot supporter, and I can't really even pronounce it, but Amska Pupkani 
Mm -hmm. Looks to flip to Mexican paratroopers. Well, the heat-driven fury didn't last long, and Leonidas loses all of the cities he took back, as well as Tigrana Serta, while Nicomedia looks likely to fall. Over in the east, Gyambri looks like it's going to fall to Sibir, who has two paratroopers next to the very low health city. Never mind, it's not Gyambri that was going to fall to Kamcha of Sibir, it was in fact Artashat, but most likely followed by Gyambri. All Australian cities on India have been taken by Vietnam, but two valiant great generals remain to die a horrible, horrible death. The loss of this area must be due in part to the airplanes stored on many carriers that Vietnam has in the area. Everyone, welcome Vindia. Koreans have giant death robots. Their tech is truly skyrocketing and is only going to increase after the war with Yakusha. Speaking of Yakusha, an age-old rivalry flares up again as the Inuit take Isit, and aside from an all-but-dead embarked modern armor, Taigan has no nearby melee units to take it back. Korea continues to push Mongolia and takes Shanghai while pushing towards Tabriz from the south and east. But the real news here is that the Finnish paratroopers just got an upgrade. Now armed with XCOM squads, border gore will spread far and wide. This also spells very bad news for Sparta. And so Korea takes Tabriz and their push loses no speed as they continue forward to either Bashbalik or Dalan Zagrabad of Agrava or something. Both very low health cities. Boer peacekeepers look on in shock as many died despite their best efforts. Another showing of the beautiful giant death robot. Also something I should have pointed out, Finnish units are outnumbering Yakusha by a massive amount as I believe most of Darkon's units are in the west of his empire. Led by none other than Stone Cold Steve Austin and Chuck Norris themselves, Texas takes back Laredo. Buccaneer forces must have weakened Mexico enough for Texas to have slipped in and... Good God. Texas is housing an atomic bomb. He's going to do it. And he did it. Texas just nuked Mexico. It's a beautiful thing to see a rump state declare war on a much more powerful neighbor and then nuke them. Godspeed, Texas. Godspeed. The devastation of the nuke will be felt for a while now by Mexico, and I'm sure Texas will be punished for this at some point. Meanwhile, to the north, Mexico has taken Amskaskapipikani. Outrage in the Inuit lands as seals are banned by the world. From aboard a dilapidated destroyer, Lester B. Pearson of Canada has voted seven times just to bring down the Inuit, for all the good it will do. Well, shows what I know, as Gyumri didn't fall to Sibir, but instead to Finland. Nicomedia was also taken, and Epidauros looks to follow suit. Spartan forces are very scarce now, and it looks like from now on it could be a Finnish steamroll with their new XCOMs. Most of the fallout around Hanoi has been cleared out. The same cannot be said, however, for Australian Japan. Leonidas will not die without a fight. In another rush, he takes back Trebizond from Kekkonen. Sparta has fought very stubbornly in their dogpile war, despite the odds, but now it's looking close to the end. Despite his numerical and technological inferiority, Taigen Dukan takes Jakusai and Tiflis from Korea, and no doubt the Finnish-owned Turfan is making it very hard for Sejong to push forward, instead either having to paradrop over or go around. Stealth bombers abound in Koro, Finland will undoubtedly put these to good use, and along with their XCOMs, they could very well take more cities during the conflict. And so Sejong's involvement in the conflict comes to an end, as a peace deal is struck between him and Taigen, who has kept his capital city, but lost to Fliss and Iktirkikilalala. Man, these orcish cities are hard to pronounce since we last saw this area. Sejong has done extremely well recently, and this could be a, a way for him to achieve a great amount of power, assuming all this warmongering hasn't pissed off the trungs. Now that they are unbothered by Sejong, the Horse Lords can throw down mano a mano, aside from Sibir, but they haven't done anything on account of Finnish peacekeepers. However, both sides are extremely tired from the fighting with Korea, especially Yakusha, who still has less land units than civilians. However, it seems like the fighting will need to funnel through the two land tiles connecting Kanu and to Hija and Amrikre. God, I am th the worst at pronouncing cities. I apologize. 
You late, Gus. This would have been much more timely back when Sparta was still in Sparta. Well, Kekkonen has made further gains against Sparta, taking Epidauros and Hebron, as well as taking back Trebizond. Parks declares war against Kekkonen, and you might think this is irrelevant, but it isn't. Sorta. They've both got units in Icelandic France, so there will be fighting there to absolutely no end whatsoever. Well, Parks got as good as he gave, possibly more, as he takes even more nukes from the Trungs. That entire area will be at risk if it's not reinforced. A Persian privateer sails meekly past ships of aluminum in a land far from home. The captain sighed a heavy sigh and cursed to the gods again that he was a man with no home. A Texan musician plays the most inspiring battle songs Texas has ever heard, and the sons of Austin charge towards Mexico, emboldened by their nuking. Somehow, somehow Brazil hasn't managed to take a single city from Chile this part. How? How, Pedro, you are so massive, technologically advanced, time-proven enemy of Chile. Come on, mate. Do something. Anything. As Sebo is surrounded by Vietnamese troops, Aioli falls to the trungs. This is rather surprising due to Park's lead in production. He should have the upper hand by now, but he hasn't made any significant gains in this war. In fact, he's done the opposite. Meanwhile, the Vietnamese showcase their power armor infantry, further demonstrating their power. See? Look at this! Parks, send it up! We want blood! Spies also report that Parks is launching a sneak naval attack, so maybe he might actually push against the trunks sometime soon? Maybe? But speaking of sneak attacks, look at all of these! Henry Morgan plans to attack Immortal Chairman Mao, a battle he cannot win. But looking at Semiramis' report earlier in the part, maybe the spies are lying out of their teeth about sneak attacks and whatnot for once. And so we come to the info attic slides, beginning with Paul Kruger the Terrible of the Boers, who is coming first in most things, including military. This shows just how much this war has taken out of Vietnam and Australia, who both previously were beating Kruger in manpower. The population gap between Parks and Kruger is stunning. 450 million population, and Parks is second place in population. There's no question as to how Kruger is getting all that science. Looking between the Trunks info and Parks's, you'd assume their war would be quite easy for Parks, but it really hasn't been. Strange given the production and science gap between the two. The Inuit edge out ahead of Australia by two cities to take top spot on the cities list. If Ekonik really wanted to, he could have taken the rest of North America by now with his technology, production, and city count. But unfortunately, he just isn't willing to spill the blood required, nor is he going to kill his Blackfoot brothers. And so we come to Kumsha Khan of Sibir, currently in third place with military manpower. Kumsha has a good opportunity right now to attack Vietnam or Mongolia. If he capitalizes, he could become a massive threat in the game. Next is Captain Kekkonen of Finland, who has performed very well this part, absolutely destroying the Middle Eastern portion of Sparta. Given his city count, he's been keeping pace with titans like Vietnam and Sibir, which is impressive in and of itself. Next is Henry Morgan, another man with some opportunities presented to him. He could try to damage Brazil, who are being so magnificently quiet recently, or he could even attack Parks if he so dares. We come to Master Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden, who has performed well this game, coming up very quickly to become a large power in Europe, enough to challenge previously established superpowers Finland and Iceland. Speaking of Iceland, we have Ingolfur Arneson of Iceland, who really doesn't have many opportunities currently, aside from attacking Henry Morgan and possibly gaining Iberia and Morocco. Ingolfur has performed very well in my opinion, coming from a rock of ice and small island. He conquered Ireland and the UK before blitzing France, and now he has a small chunk of the Mediterranean. Sejong the Terrible is up next. Sejong has done very well recently, declaring war on two weak neighbors. His only fault is not continuing these wars when he really had the potential to do so. That said, with their new cities, Korea's science could skyrocket up, which presents its own set of opportunities. Here we have the religion slide, and the hardcore followers of the Ayubid Party Pope are still around. Catholicism is still the largest religion around, with 50 more cities than Judaism, and about 400 more followers, too. France may have been eliminated, but as the community said, the spirit of the French lives on in this religion map. Je suis Nice, vive la France.
And finally, here is the Club of Losers created by JRU247, who is also the creator of the Agent M series on the Civ Battle Royale forums, which you should definitely check out if you have not already. It's really, really well done. I've been Whitefang131, your narrator for the Civ Battle Royale Part 65. Take care all, and see you next Sunday. And this has been Dawkins with another iteration of the Civ Battle Royale audio narration. Join us next week with Burger Krieg for Part 66. We'll see you next time.